Right before we jump into this real world review, if you haven't signed up for the Frontos Photo email list, just look for this orange box over on the website, put your name, email address in it, hit send it, and I will send you a free guide to capturing motion in low light situations. Jared Poland, Frontos Photo. Dot com, and this is a real world review of the Canon 5D Mark IV. All right, guys, so I got the Canon 5D Mark IV one day after it was announced, which is awesome. Thank you, Canon, for sending that out. And I also want to thank Alan's camera for hooking me up with the lens rentals for most of the lenses that I'll be using in this real world review. So we're at Studio No Yo here in Fishtown, PA, not too far from the Fro Factory, where we have a band set up behind us because what is a better way to test out a camera than to do a real world review? That's what we're here to do, to test out the new specs. Whether they're good, they're bad, they're indifferent, it doesn't matter. We're here to use this camera. Now, I've only had it for a couple of days and I've set it up, so I've had a chance to play with it, to set it up, but I haven't done an actual photo shoot with it and that's what we're here to do with this real world review. So follow me along as we shoot and test out this Canon 5D Mark IV. Today in the studio, we have the band Ill Dutes, and it's my goal to use the 5D Mark IV to try to get awesome stills as well as video, but we're gonna start off getting stills. All right, so I brought out a lot of lenses. I have the Hebrew Trinity plus some. I've got the 11 to 24, 24 to 70, 70 to 200, 100 macro. I've got the 85 1.2, the 50 1.2, and an 8 to 15 f4. That's a lot of lenses, but I want to go through the bag and get a lot of different angles, try different things, try out all the settings of this camera, and try to get the best photos possible. So you're going to see me switching around quite a bit because I'm getting different ideas as I'm going through this shoot. So let's take a look at the general specs of this camera. You have a 30.4 megapixel CMOS sensor. Now that's up from 22 megapixels on the 5D Mark III. Now some people might say that's not a huge jump and they want more, but I think 30 megapixels is a pretty good spot to be. It goes from ISO 100 all the way up to 32,000, and that right there isn't even a full stop better than the 5D Mark III. Three. Now, part of the reason there is that you went from 22 megapixels to 30.4 megapixels. That's why your ISO isn't expanding that far. But because it has a Digic 6 Plus processor opposed to the Digic 5 Plus, I think you're going to see some clean images coming out of this camera. All right, guys, one of the coolest functions that I found in this camera when setting it up is that I can map out the AF on button or the star button back here to do something that no other camera I've personally used has let me do. And what that is, is being able to switch with one press of a button from continuous focus, the AI servo, to single focus without having to take my face away from the camera to look for another button somewhere. I just have the AF on set where when I look through, right now it's set to AF single shot. When I press it, it's now on the servo. That is a kick-ass feature. So 
So one of the greatest features added to this camera is the 3.2 inch touchscreen. I absolutely love having a touchscreen on the back of a DSLR, especially the high-end ones and not just the lower-end ones. Why? Because I can touch the settings that I want to touch. I can set it any way that I want by hitting the Q button and make all the changes right on the back of the camera. But also, I can touch a picture, I can swipe through pictures, I can pinch to zoom pictures. This function is great and it makes me question why on the Canon 1DX Mark II they don't have it always on. Meaning you can't go through the menu system and touch it, but on this camera we can. One of the major issues with this camera that I personally have is the fact that it has old technology for the memory card slots. You're looking at having a compact flash card and a SD card slot, which is a UHS-1, not UHS-2. The biggest mistake was not putting in a CFast card slot, especially being that this camera does 4 K. It's using the old technology which doesn't make any sense and being that this camera shoots 7 frames a second you're only going to get 21 frames in a row when you're using the compact flash card and you're only going to get 19 when you're using the SD and if you're going to use the dual pixel raw which is a new setting you're only going to get 7 frames in a row before you fill that buffer. Today I'm going to be shooting raw plus JPEG directly into the camera using both the compact flash card and the SD. Now the reason I'm doing that is because at the time of recording this, Adobe Lightroom did not accept the RAW files to allow me to edit them, but also because I have two memory card slots, I always want to shoot redundant. What that means is that I have two cards in the camera that I am saving both files. The same exact files go to one card as go to the other card just in case there's ever an issue. But because I'm shooting to both cards, it's going to slow down my buffer and it's going to give me less frames that I can shoot in a row. And keep in mind, that wouldn't have been an issue if they used a CFast card slot and the updated UHS-2 SD card slot. So let's talk about the ergonomics. Now, not much has changed from the 5D Mark III, but you will notice that it is a couple of ounces lighter. Now, they updated the joystick, they moved the nameplate, and they also added an AF area selection button on the back that is remappable. Now, I personally remapped it to be the ISO button so I don't have to take my eye away from the camera when I want to change the ISO. They added a USB 3.0 terminal, which is great if you're going to be a tethered shooter. They also changed the placement of the shutter release cable port. Other than that, it's pretty much the same. One other thing we remapped is the lock button. We set it so that if you have it on lock, it disables the touchscreen. Now, I personally love the touchscreen, but that lock button doesn't do very much for me anyway, so we did that just in case we need to turn off touch screen functionality. So here's a feature that could be revolutionary, it's the dual pixel raw. What this means is that you have the ability to make micro adjustments after the fact if you shoot in dual pixel raw. But when you switch over into dual pixel raw, you're actually doubling the file size and you're slowing down the amount of frames you can shoot a second and you're going to fill up that buffer much quicker. Now when you get that file back into the computer, currently you can only open it in DPP. Adobe has said that Lightroom will be able to open it in the future, but as of now, you can only use DPP to make one of the two micro adjustments, either changing the bokeh or slightly changing the focus. Now, this could come in handy if you want to get that eyeball in focus and you see that you're focused on the eyelash or something else. You may be able to tweak the focus ever so slightly to make sure that the eye is in focus and what you don't want to is actually not in focus. 
It's an interesting thing. It's going to get better, but remember, they are micro adjustments. Now, you also have to ask yourself, are you going to shoot every single picture you take in dual pixel raw? If you're going to do that, you are gonna lose frames per second. You're gonna slow down your buffer. You're going to cause your file size to double. I personally can't see shooting everything in dual pixel raw. Maybe only those portraits that you want to be sharp, but when you say only the ones you want to be sharp, I want every single picture to be in focus and tack sharp. So this is something that's new. It's going to continue to get better if I had to guess, but right now I would be very selective about where I use it. Keep in mind that dual pixel raw is only for stills. It's not there for video at this time. So I was just doing tight headshots of Jordan over here. And what I noticed is that I may have been focusing on the dreadlocks and not his eye. I'm trying, because he's moving and I'm doing continuous focus. So I just switched over into the dual pixel raw to take some photos to see what happens if we can, if, if, I, if I hit the dreadlock, can I switch it and have it go back to the eye? That would be an amazing feature, but I, I have in the back of my mind that it may not go that far because it's micro adjustments. But we'll see what happens, we're playing around. Just like the 5D Mark III, you still have 61 auto-focusing points with 41 of them being cross-type. You would have thought that they would have made it even better, but they slightly did by expanding the focusing points vertically to give you a little bit more room. It does have the same focusing system as the 1DX Mark II, which I absolutely love shooting. So I'm personally a big fan of the focus beep when I am in single focus point trying to get the shot. What I've realized is they're playing music and it's not super loud, I can't even hear it. Now, and I've known this with my Nikons that there's three levels of, well there's two levels of pitches and three levels of, uh, of loudness that you can do for the focus beep. In here, I think it's just on and off. I wish that was louder. Of course, that's a minor, minor thing and it's personal preference, but uh, I just wish it was a little louder. This is where Wi-Fi would come into play. All right, so we know this camera does not have an articulating screen. That's one thing that a lot of people would like to see is a screen that comes out and rotates. In this situation, I would love to get at a higher angle, but I can't see through the viewfinder. So that's where an art articulating screen would help to give me the angle that I want. Now this camera does have Wi-Fi built in, but right now I don't feel like setting it up to take the time and miss the shots that I have right here. If I have time, I'm going to try and set that up and try to get the shot that I need using the Wi-Fi and probably my iPhone to be the to be my eyes basically 
Here's a subtle update that Canon did. They updated the viewfinder to the viewfinder 2. Now what you will notice is that you have the ability to put more information inside the viewfinder. I can see whether I'm on AI servo or whether I'm on single. I can see that I'm shooting raw plus JPEG. I have all these different options that I can put right inside the viewfinder. That should make your job much easier. All right, so here's a quick tip for you. If you're shooting ultra wide and you put your lenses down like on that table over there, they're probably gonna show up in your ultra wide pictures. You may wanna move them out of the way, but for this shoot, I'm actually gonna leave them right there. I uh, just wanted to let you know that that is actually why they're still in there because I didn't move them while I stand on this table taking pictures. All right, guys, go ahead. So here's something in the 5D Mark IV that I'm not very happy with, but it's something that's in the Canon 1DX Mark II. I'm in AI servo right now, or even if I am in single focus, the point is not always lit red. The focus point is not always on. In servo, it's blinking at me. It should be always on. I'm having trouble finding it because it's not always lit. And I'm trying to shoot into the shadow area. And what's happening is I can't find my focus point. So I'm trying to go find where it's going. So that's something that I wish they had always on. They have the same focusing system as the Canon 1DX Mark II. For the most part, why doesn't it have this feature? This is one of the most important features is to have always on focus points. So they're always lit red so you know where they're at.
So I just switched over to the 85 1.2 to try and get some cool shallow depth of field headshots or portraits. And I'm gonna switch over into the dual pixel raw to see how that works out. Because if I'm off by just a little bit, I wanna be able to see how that micro adjustment works. So let's, let's see, let's do it. I, I just have to go into the menu system real quick and I go in there and I hit enable and now dual pixel raw is on. I grab you for a couple of portraits? Yeah. I'm just gonna put you right here. Facing me. Yeah, because I'm looking for the light. Window light behind me, right into your face is pretty cool, especially with the guys in the background. I'm just gonna take a look. There you go, hold it, hold it, hold it still. I try to make sure that my focus is tack, just because we're shooting at f1.2. All right, so you're gonna see me shooting vertically. Now, normally I would be using a grip, but the grips aren't out yet for this camera. So if I was to own this, I would definitely want to have the grip so that I can go vertical and shoot this way instead of having to reach my hand over like this. Let me jump in here real quick to say if you are looking to get professional results with your DSLR when shooting video, I have the perfect guide for you. It's the Fronos Photo Guide to DSLR Video. Go to fronosphoto.com slash DSLR hyphen video hyphen guide to get a free preview right now to see how amazing this guide is. Now let's get back to the real world review. It doesn't want to hit it. Hold on. I meant the camera doesn't want to hit it.
So this camera adds Wi-Fi, NFC, and GPS. Now, I'm not personally a big fan of GPS, but you can use it to set it to the atomic clock so that you can match multiple cameras to get the proper time. Now, with Wi-Fi, you can use the Canon Connect app, which is a pretty awesome app, and it's really simple and easy to connect multiple devices to just one camera. I used it here in the studio to kind of get a drums from above feel, where I put a monopod together, put the camera on top of it, shot straight down, so I was balancing it on my stomach using one hand holding the phone. I would then touch to focus where I wanted it to be, get my focus locked in, and then hit the shutter button, and it was almost instant. There was really not much lag there when I went to take the picture. So that's a function that can come in handy when you're shooting stills, but also when you're shooting video. Woo! All right. That is a, that is a workout to do that, guys. I'm going to move on to something else. One of the challenging things is balancing this and getting straight lines. You know I'm a big fan of straight lines. So one thing about the Canon 5D Mark IV is the high ISO capability. Everybody wants to know, how is it? Well, one of the best ways to find out is to go into the sound booth behind me, which is ultra dark, and push the ISO to the extremes and see if I can get some good photos. So let's get into the booth. Now I went into the sound booth because it was super dark in there and I thought that would be a great situation to try out the high ISO capability of this camera. Now basically looking at the back of the screen, everything looked pretty good, but the only way to tell if the results are usable or not is to get it back to the loft and see how they turned out. So how did the camera handle? Honestly, I think it handled fairly well. It felt like I was using the 5D Mark III all over again, but with updated functions and buttons and features that I think did a great job. One thing I want to tell you is once you get out of the way of the camera and start to concentrate on getting quality results, then you can start to get amazing photos. But the only way to tell if the photos are good from today's shoot is to go back to the loft, edit them, and give you my final feedback. All right, so now we're gonna get into the video functions of this camera. We know it does stills, we know it does video. They've added 4K this time, as well as the dual pixel AF. We have a bunch of toys to play with. We wanna make a cool little video snippet, so that's why I'm gonna turn it over to Todd, who's gonna grab the camera and start shooting. Todd, you're up.
One of the best features for video in this camera is dual pixel AF. It is absolutely incredible. It even has the ability to track faces while recording video. That's always been one of the issues that people have with DSLRs is that you don't have the ability to focus as well as you did with camcorders. Well, now you do with the dual pixel AF. One of the things that I noticed when we were shooting video with our subjects is that we were locked in on the face. And when the subject left the frame and then came back, the focus was reacquired right on the face. The focus is absolutely incredible. This is one of those key features that not many cameras offer you. And that's what makes this a great camera for shooting video, especially when you want to have it do continuous autofocus for video. Another thing that is great here is that you have a touch screen. So if you're locked off on a tripod or you're flying on something else and you want to touch the back of the screen to have it focus, you have the ability to do that. You could focus on something in the foreground, you could focus on something in the background, and you can watch it cinematically make those movements. That feature right there alone is worth the price of admission. To go along with the dual pixel AF, you have the ability to use the built-in Wi-Fi to connect to your mobile phone, to connect to a tablet and control where you want the focus to be. So there was one situation where we were shooting video with a slider really close to the ground where the articulating screen would have came in handy. But being that it doesn't have it and it offers you Wi-Fi, we were able to connect to the iPad to be able to see it as a external screen. Was it good? It worked. Is it the best option? It's not that bad, but we wish that it would have had an articulating screen for shooting video. A lot of people have been waiting for the 5D series to start shooting 4K video. Well, it now does 4K video up to 30 frames a second in full DCI cinema. It's using the Motion JPEG codec and you're getting 500 megabits a second. So one of the biggest gripes I have with the camera and its video shooting capabilities is the fact that it shoots with a 1.74 crop factor. That means when you put on that 11 millimeter, that 11 to 24 F4, you're getting a 19 millimeter or so equivalent. For example, we're using the 50 millimeter 1.2 on the 5D Mark IV to shoot this video of me, and that's giving you the equivalent of an 87 millimeter lens because of the 1.74 crop factor. You want to be able to shoot full frame when you have 4K. There's a lot of other cameras on the market that do that. Is it a deal breaker? It's not completely a deal breaker, but it is something that I would love to see this camera offer that it does not offer. One thing video shooters will be happy with that in 4K, you're shooting at 422, and in 1080, you're shooting at 420. 422 is important because it gives you more latitude in post-production. Now, its bigger brother, the 1DX Mark II, can do 60 frames at 4K, and it can also do 120 frames at 1080. So I think that this 5D Mark IV is lacking in some of the specs that it offers you, but I think that's because Canon has a cinema line that they're trying to protect. One other thing that you can't do is you can't do clean out to 4K. The 1DX Mark II couldn't do that either. That right there is clearly telling you that Canon is more focused on their cinema line for people that just want to focus on shooting video. Another feature that you have is if you need to pull still from 4K video, you can do that with an 8 megapixel screen grab. Now that may only come in handy if you're shooting music videos or you're on set and you want to pull a frame from that 4K video. I don't really see many photographers shooting 4K video and pulling stills out from it to go ahead and make prints. I just don't think that is where it's at. But on the other side, if you are shooting videos and you just need some stills for Facebook or for social media, maybe that could come in handy. Let's talk a little more about frame rate. We know that this camera camera can do 4K at 30 frames a second. It also does 1080 at 60 and at 720 it gives you a 120 frame rate a second video. Now keep in mind that that is baked in as soon as you hit stop recording because it's processed inside the camera. One of the things we notice when you're shooting 120 frames a second at 720 you lose the ability to have the autofocus so you need to manually focus your video. This camera offers you HDR video mode. Now keep in mind it's only at 1080 at 30 frames a second and it's using the IPB compression. Now what's actually going on there is it's shooting at 60 frames a second and it's alternating exposures to give you that HDR effect. Now this
this is something new. It's not something I really recommend using right now unless you're a blogger or somebody out there that really needs this HDR, especially because it's compressed. But maybe this is a precursor to future cameras where HDR will continue to get better for when you're shooting video. Here's a new feature in this camera. You now have the ability to shoot time-lapse video right inside the camera. Now keep in mind, you're only going to get two minute videos at a clip, but that should be something pretty cool to test out. Feeling like I'm trapped in a time machine. Feeling like I'm trapped in a time machine. Feeling like I'm trapped in a time machine. Is anybody clocking me? Feeling like I'm trapped in a time machine. Feeling like I'm trapped in a time machine. Feeling like I'm trapped in a time machine. Is anybody clocking me? Four years, boy, we've been training from the caves. Gathering supplies, now roles getting paid. Man, gangsters getting grades, lames getting graves. Graduated, G, no games. We've been taking this serious for a long time. Can't feel my shows, my closure couldn't fold mine. Whole time, feel it sitting on the gold mine. Landmine, step off, it's a bad time. Pathfinder, pull up on turf. Open the dirt, and it's looking like bird. I'm cold. Might as well say yes Why say no? Hotter than the coldest snow Ho, what up? Two more hoes in this Christmas Motherfucker, Mr. So Back to that ass kissing Motherfucker, I can spit it consistent Till you listen, motherfucker I'm distant like bad mothers You stinking like burnt trapper sniper Feeling like I'm trapped in a time machine Feeling like I'm trapped in a time machine I guess that makes me the sniper More like a viper than rifle Cause I'm all tongue I touch down, then they all run As if it wasn't already over I already told you My raps is like crack rock jackpot girls Already sober I'm super like solar Super like Nova Super like the man Clark Kent And I got the baddest chick as my lowest You got a chip, bitch I got a fucking brick on my shoulder In the well I act this even still I stay focused, you know this I'm feeling like I'm trapped in a time machine Feeling like I'm trapped in a time machine Feeling like I'm trapped in a time machine Is there anybody clocking me? Feeling like I'm trapped in a time machine Feeling like I'm trapped in a time machine Feeling like I'm trapped in a time machine Is there anybody clocking me? Right before we take a look at the images, if you haven't subscribed here on YouTube just yet, please go ahead and hit the subscribe button so you can be notified when all of my videos go live. Don't forget to leave a comment, give it a thumbs up, and if you haven't signed up for the Fronos Photo email list just yet, look for this orange box over on my website. Put your name, email address in it, hit send it, and I will send you a free guide to capturing motion in low light situations. Now let's go look at some pictures. So here we are back at the loft where I'm gonna go through some of my favorite images from this shoot as well as share information about how I think this camera actually handled and who it's for. But before we do that, I wanna remind you that we are shooting with the Canon 5D Mark IV in 4K right here. And I also have the Canon XC10 on that camera focused in on me for a second angle. Also, if you go over to the website, you can download all the full res JPEGs that were exported as well as some of the raw files. And I'm even going to include some of the DPR, the dual pixel raw files, but keep in mind, you need to have DPP, Canon's DPP, in order to open that up and use those files. So let's take a look at some of the pictures right here. So generally speaking, I'm pretty happy with what I started to see. I love wide angle shots like this to show the entire scene, to get the colors. Uh, I just also want to tell you that I didn't shoot any super low ISO shots because the scenes didn't call for it. So if you're looking to see a 100 ISO picture, it's not going to happen because I didn't do it for this type of shoot because it was pretty low light. But I love shots like this where you can shoot ultra wide and I absolutely am in love with that 11 to 24 lens. It gives me such a nice angle of view, great color, great tones, and I'm very happy with the shadow capability. Look at this. 
Look at the shadow that you can bring. You can bring all this stuff back. I am happy with what I'm able to do with these RAW files. So the RAW files have looked pretty good coming out of the camera. They've given me a lot of latitude, a lot of punch. They've given me a lot of play with the exposure because on some of them you can see I'm up to a stop and a half off because I'm trying to cheat the system. But I picked this photo because it's a fisheye shot. Now, you guys know I'm not a huge fan of the fisheye. I rented from Alan's camera the 8-15 to f4 for a reason, because I wanted to use it at 15 millimeters just in case I had the opportunity to get an interesting fisheye shot. When you do fisheye properly, like I think this photo is a proper fisheye shot, you can see the difference and how it actually makes sense. When your symmetry is right on and it works, verse when you mess it up because I messed it up in one of the other shots where if you look at the difference between the two my line I'm not straight on here so it makes the image look awkward it looks like you're tilting whereas the image before you can see this line right here is absolutely straight and everything is symmetrical so that worked out now moving into this picture I took this in dual pixel raw before I jump in to edit the dual pixel raw let me tell you this I don't think I'm going to shoot in dual pixel raw if I am using this camera. It doubles the frame, uh, it, it doubles the size of the raw file, which itself isn't that big of a deal, but in just a second, you're gonna see how clunky it is using DPP, and in the future, I'm pretty sure Adobe is going to allow you to open and start tweaking those files. Don't know when that's gonna happen, but you're gonna see how clunky DPP is in just a second. So I thought this would be a great test to, because he has the dreads, to try and use the dual pixel raw. And in this case, it actually looks like I missed focus, but when I'm zooming in one-to-one -one and really pixel peeping, you can sort of see that. But when you look at the print of this, you could never tell whether it was super tack on or super tack off, like tack on, tack off, Mr. Miyagi style. But I tried to go into DPP for that photo and there was nothing that I could do. It just didn't change enough. So here I'm gonna show you how this works. We're gonna start dual pixel raw for one of these portraits that I took just to show you what happens. And this is pretty slow. It has to bring up the file and it's taken a little while to do so. And then here is the image. You can see that I am in focus on his nose. I missed, for whatever reason with the 8512, whatever I was shooting at, I missed. But here, let me show you what you can do. You can go to image, uh, micro adjustments, and I'll show you what can happen. I'm gonna leave the strength at five right now. Let's go all the way to the front and watch what happens where it shifts. Did you see it shift down? All right, let's go and shift back and make a micro adjustment to show you what it's doing. It shifted up to here to this area. I don't know what strength is actually doing. Maybe it's just a form of sharpening, but you can see what's happening, how it sharpened that right there. And then what we do, we can go all the way back to front, back to front, like I just said, and you can see how it shifts. So I'm gonna cancel this out. So I'm gonna show you this image right here. Tools, start dual pixel raw. It's gonna load. Another reason I wouldn't use this. So when you zoom in on the eye, you can see that I'm pretty darn close. I'm gonna turn image micro adjustments on. Let's go see what happens when we go to the front because it looks like it's pretty sharp. And then it's so fine, it's fine. I, I can barely see what's going on in here sometimes when I'm trying to make changes. I can go all the way this way. And yes, I can see that the eyelashes got a little blurrier and maybe the image looks better. But let me zoom out right here because I wanna show you the bokeh shift. You can only do one of these at a time. Watch what happens to the background in this area. You see how it shifted left to right? That's what's happening. It, it's, it's going left to right, it's shifting the bokeh. So I really don't see this as something I'm personally gonna use. It's so finite, the micro adjustment is so small that even if I'm, if I'm off on the eye by just a little bit, I don't think anybody's ever going to notice that. And this workflow takes way too long to do. Not only are you gonna double your file sizes, you're gonna quadruple how long it takes you to actually edit the images. So it's a cool feature that somewhere in the future is going to continue to get better. Right now, I really don't see the point in using it. That's just my opinion. So what do you guys think? Leave a comment down below with what you think if it's going to be worth using. So let's get back to the images right here. All right, so I just, I like this photo. But let me tell you something that I absolutely loved 
in this camera. The fact that I am able to map specific buttons on the back of the camera to do something that I cannot do in my Nikon D5 is absolutely incredible. Taking the back button focus and being able to, when I press it, and I said this earlier, but I really want to hammer it home, is that when I press the button and I go from AI servo to AI single with a single press of my thumb while I'm looking through the camera, that is game changing for me. That alone should be or could be a reason you would go from a 5D Mark III to a 5D Mark IV, but there's plenty more reasons why I think people with 5D Mark III's as professionals should jump up to the 5D Mark IV, and that's one of them. I've started to fall in love with the Canon menu system. It's just so intuitive and easy. I always thought it was weird, when I think actually Nikon's may be a little weirder, but there's some things better on the Nikon side when it comes to the video angle, but that's about it. Let, let's go back to some of these pictures right here. All right, so let's jump through some of these photos. I just picked a bunch of them that I thought were my favorite ones. I just like this angle and I like the color. And, and the way that I processed it, you can see the shadow, you can see where it started. This is where it started, this is where it went, because his face is away from the, is away from the light. So yeah, keep going. One of my favorite shots, lining it up, getting a, the symmetry is right on, the center of the frame is right on, love the black and white. Uh, this is one of my all-time favorite shots from the shoot. I actually printed this one out because I loved it, because it shows the studio, it shows the guys hanging out in the back, it shows him working right here. That's a great shot. Moving on, other shots that are pretty good. Just showing you some details. Very happy with the colors, the tones, and the things that I'm pulling out of it. That stuff I like. Um, I shot this in DPR also, but when I went in to do the micro adjustments, it was I actually was able to get the, the window super in focus, but then I think that would mean that the face actually is out. And that's sometimes an issue that you run into. If you focus on the pupil and that's sharper, it's actually focusing behind you, even though that's behind you when you're shooting. So yeah, I'm very happy with that. Standing up high, cool, cool getting those shots. Now, I didn't motor drive through anything when I did this shoot. Why? Because it didn't call for motor driving. You have the seven frames a second. And one of the biggest complaints about the camera is the memory card slots. The fact that you have the compact flash and you have the SD and it's an older style of memory card that's not super duper fast but you do get 21 frames in a row in the buffer to the compact flash card. If you're somebody who's going to be holding down the shutter button for, for three whole seconds and taking 21 shots, you may need to check yourself because you're taking way too many photos in a row. Now, I'm absolutely upset with Canon for not putting a CFast card in there. We can't let them get a pass on that. But you also have to understand that this camera is doing a fantastic job. The 21 frames is plenty. Even if you are taking seven shots in a row, you're not going to outrun it unless you try to outrun the buffer. I didn't run into any issues with it, but that's because I wasn't doing seven frames a second. Even if you were going to shoot sports, it's still going to handle very well. I think the 5D Mark IV is one of those all-encompassing cameras cameras that can do a little bit of everything and do it well. So love shots like this. It actually got all of the band members in there from here, here, and here. That stuff is cool. Just moving on, some detailed shots, like the colors, like the tones, love the contrast that I'm able to pull out of these raw files. Very happy with what's going on right in there. And then moving on to a more photojournalistic style shot. This is where that continuous into single button uh, came into play. I just love doing this. And I, and I have this sequence of, uh, of Rick right here that I love. I love this photo. The print looks incredible. The tones on it look awesome. And when you blow it up to the 17 by 22 that I printed it out on, even though this is 1600 ISO, you shouldn't see grain with that anyway at 1600. Everything looks great in that print. And I just love what I was able to capture with this shot or with this series of shots. Keep on moving on. Love the wide. Look how straight the lines are. Everything's on with this. But then we move into this moment. Mode, where I had Wi-Fi on. I had Wi-Fi on, held the camera up over on a monopod, was using the phone to tap focus and to take the shots. It gave me a unique perspective on what's going on. Here they're, they're just going over the lyrics. Oh, and by the way, keep this in mind back here. Look how dark that room is. We're going to be getting to that in just a second. I liked what I was able to do with the Wi-Fi. Fast focusing, fast shooting. As soon as I pressed the button, it was shooting photos. And it gives you a unique perspective. Uh, 
it, it's, it's great. This is very drums from above. That's what I was going for. Why don't I shoot down on the drummer and get his entire kit in there? And that's what happened. Don't forget, go play with these raw files. Um, this is 12,800. I'll show you where it started, all right? It started like this. And when I printed it 17 by 22, it looks good. It doesn't look bad if you're standing back. Yes, you're going to see the grain. You're going to see the dots. You're going to see that little bit of grain there, but it's not really that big of a deal. This is how dark it was in there, and look what I was able to do with the file and bring it back a stop and a half off. I was that far off at 12,800 ISO and still was able to bring it back, have it be clean, and even with some more touching up, I think you guys would be able to make the file even better, and you can go download this file and play with it. Now, moving on to the 20,000 ISO, ISO. The only thing lighting up his face here is the phone. And the phone, I mean, this is clean as can be at 20,000. I did some at 32,000 as well. This is 20. The 32,000 looked fine. And this is 102,400. It's the H2 not recommended mode. Looks perfect. Well, <laughs> I can't say it looks perfectly fine. It looks usable. If you needed to use it in a situation, you could make it work. It's an extreme situation. But the fact that the file here has color and it still works, that's saying that the ISO is better in this camera. That's the thing to keep in mind, that between the 5D Mark III and the 5D Mark IV, the ISO is, has gotten better. The sensor is newer. Yes, it's more megapixels, but I'm happy with where the ISO has allowed me to take it, and I'm happy with the colors that have come out of it. All right, so that looks like the last image that I have pulled to show you guys. Go check out the full res JPEGs over on the site and download those raw files. Let's talk about the video real quick. Now, we know that this camera does 4K because you're seeing it being shot in 4K right now, and it also has that 1.74X crop factor. So you're losing that extra wide angle. But at the end of the day, it's not that big of a deal. This is a tool that you put in your hands to get fantastic results. Our video looks incredible that we captured with this camera. And was it a pain in the ass that my 11 millimeter wasn't an 11 millimeter? Absolutely. But does that mean that I wouldn't buy this camera because it just didn't go wide enough? No. It's what you do with the footage that you capture that determines how good the video actually is. It's not always the camera. Now, that's not just saying to Canon that it's okay that they did this. It would have been great if they didn't. But what I will tell you that is absolutely incredible in this camera, and I haven't seen it in any other camera do it as well as it does here and in the upper, the 1DX Mark II, is the dual pixel AF is unbelievable. There is no other way to explain it than it is absolutely incredible that you can lock in on a lead singer, go backwards, 25, 30 feet, and then walk back towards the singer and fill the frame with his face and have it all have been tracked and in focus. That dual pixel AF is unbelievable. And the fact that this camera doesn't have a rotatable articulating screen, the touch screen is incredible for when you're shifting your focus points from the mallets to another mallet to another mallet or whatever it is that you wanna pull them, whether it's on the back of the screen or on an iPhone or on an iPad like we used. Is the articulating screen needed? Not really so much on a camera like this. And again, to talk about the memory cards, they don't hold you back. If you put in a fast compact flash card, you're gonna get your 29 minutes and 59 seconds of 4K footage, you're going to get that. You're gonna get your 720 uh, at 120 frames a second, you're gonna get your 1080 at 60 frames a second, you're gonna get everything you need to set you up in a place to get fantastic results. So that pretty much wraps up the video side of it. You heard me talk a lot about the photo side of it, but at the end of the day, what it comes down to is that this is just a tool to get quality results. It's what you do with it. I can't hammer it home enough that if you don't understand the fundamentals of photography, you are not going to get good results with a brownie camera, the worst camera in the world, the best camera in the world, or this camera. If you don't know what you're doing, you're not gonna get the best results time and time again. I'm very happy with how this camera handled. And keep in mind, I'm a Nikon shooter, but I don't care 
care what I shoot with. Whatever I put in my hands, I'm going to get great results with because I understand what I'm doing when it comes to lighting and composition. So who is this camera for? If you have a 5D Mark III, is it a worthy upgrade to a 5D Mark IV? I think it absolutely is for those full-time working professionals. If you're somebody who just loves to go shoot video or loves to go shoot photos, there's really no reason for you to jump up to it unless you really want to. If all you need is 1080 video, then there's no reason to jump up to the other one unless you want that dual pixel AF, which I think is absolutely worth it. And for those out there who think you need to shoot everything in 4K, you don't need to shoot everything in 4K. But what is really good when you shoot 4K video is when you deliver in 1080 and you do a push in to give yourself multiple angles. That is where 4K comes in handy. So that's something that's great. So if you're just looking for a well-rounded camera, how's it gonna be for weddings? It's gonna be great. How's it gonna be for portraits? It's gonna be great. How's it gonna be for video? We know it's gonna be great. You could shoot sports with this. I don't think it's the greatest sports camera in the world, but with the focusing system of the 1DX Mark Mark II in it and the quality images and the seven frames a second, I don't think you can go wrong. It's 3,500 bucks. The 5D Mark III when it came out was 3,500 bucks. So they've stuck with the same pricing pattern. And I think as a professional, you cannot go wrong with this camera if you're upgrading to it or starting today using it. So that's going to be it. Go download those files. Thank you very much for watching this video, and I'm going to leave it right there. Jared Poland, froknowsphoto.com. See ya.